All right. Now, what we have here is a video recap of the electronic structure of the atom lecture. So, so the idea here is that this is supposed to be used for revision. So I'm going to move a lot, a lot faster than I normally would in class. We're not going to have any examples either, any working out as we go through, okay? So this is a faster pace. It's something that you can stop and rewind and rewatch if you need to focus on certain parts as we go through. All right, so this is not supposed to be a substitute for attending the lecture. So do make sure you continue to attend lectures because obviously I make important announcements in lectures, so there might be a change in, uh, in when we have our lab time or our exam information, so do make sure you continue to attend lectures, but this is just a revision recap of the lecture that we had. Okay, so let's begin with historic developments of a model of the atom. So in 1808, Dalton developed the first atomic theory. It stated that each element is made up of tiny particles or atoms, and atoms of each element are identical to each other. Okay, so all of the atoms of each element is identical to each other. We now know that this isn't completely true because we have isotopes. Okay, atoms of different elements are somehow different, which is of course completely correct. So different elements, atoms, are different from each other, and compounds are formed when atoms of different elements combine. In the early 20th century, J.J. Thompson discovered the electron, which was deduced from positive particles. A high voltage was applied to a cathode ray tube, and negative particles produced at the cathode traveled to the anode. He then developed the plum pudding model of the atom. So the plum pudding model of the atom indicates that an atom is a sphere, and within that sphere we have some protons and neutrons and some electrons, but they're not arranged in any organised way. This was disproved by Rutherford uh, in 1911. When Rutherford fired alpha particles at a thin sheet of gold, some of the alpha particles returned back towards the alpha particle emitter, and this proved that the atom must have a very small and dense nucleus. So Rutherford proposed the nuclear model of an atom, but this model did have some problems. It used classical physics to describe the motions of the electrons, and this was problematic. So in 1913, Niels Bohr developed the Bohr model of the atom, which was a quantum model based on the interpretation of the line spectrum of a hydrogen atom in which electrons travel around the nucleus in an orbit. But this was our first quantum model. In 1900 to 1930, so early 1900s, we now have Planck and Einstein and Ryberg, etc., which then developed the quantum mechanical model of an atom. And this was part of a new revolution that was occurring in physics. Okay? So the quantum model, in the quantum model, electrons uh, and light are quantized respectively, so both are quantized. So the electrons now exist in a quantized state where their distance or their energy level uh, respective to the nucleus can now be explained in quantized terms. This explained experimental observations. The Bohr model was found to be wrong and the current quantum mechanical model is based on this. So Schrodinger, Heisenberg, de Broglie, Pauli all went into developing the, all contributed to developing the wave mechanics or quantum mechanical model of the atom, which we use today. It's a mathematical model which uses orbitals, which are uh, regions of space where you've got a probability of finding an electron, and the electrons are said to now have a wave-like nature rather than acting as particles. So here we have on this slide, the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so the electromagnetic spectrum shows us different wavelength of uh, electromagnetic radiation and how it relates to its energy level. So starting at extremely low frequency, uh, moving through radio waves, and then microwaves and infrared. Then we have our visible region. So our visible region of electromagnetic spectrum uh, includes the the uh, radiation that we can see. Uh, with the naked eye. Then we've got ultraviolet, which ultraviolet moves into ionizing 
uh, levels of energy than X-rays and then gamma rays. Okay, so ionizing simply means that it's got enough energy now to affect the electrons in a chemical compound. Okay, so uh, you can see that the wavelength is getting shorter and shorter as the energy level is increasing. Remembering that electromagnetic waves move at the speed of light, they move at a fixed speed, so as they increase in energy, the wavelength is getting shorter and shorter, so we're getting more oscillations per second, so we're getting more energy. So moving along to the Bohr model of the atom. So in the Bohr model of the atom, the atom is seen as an electron circling the nucleus in circular fixed orbits. Now in this model the electron was regarded as a negatively charged particle, so not a wave, a particle. The electron could move from the ground state to an excited state, so in other words to an orbit that's further away from the nucleus, and the discrete amount of energy that was given off or absorbed is called a quanta of energy. Okay, so we're now quantizing the energy. Now the electron can move to a higher energy orbit by absorbing a photon of light, and then when it moves back to a lower energy orbit, it's emitting a photon of light. Okay, so a photon is a small amount of light energy. So a quant if you like to think of it as a quanta of light energy. There are limitations to this model. So first of all, this model couldn't account for the hydrogen emission spectra. And secondly, the electron was considered only as a particle but it was the first quantum model and formed the basis of our quantum mechanical model that we use now of the atom. And you can see the diagram down here just showing us an electron moving to a higher energy state and then returning back to the ground state and emitting a photon of light. Okay, moving along to the line spectrum of hydrogen. So now we have the line spectrum of hydrogen being produced when we've got some hydrogen gas which is receiving a high energy spark and the hydrogen molecules absorb some of this energy. Now the atoms are excited or the, or the electrons in the atom are excited to a higher energy state and then when they return to their ground state some energy is emitted as, as light. So when you pass this light that's produced through a prism what you see is distinct bands of light being produced. And these bands of light correspond to the different energy levels that the electron is being excited to. Now Einstein postulated that light behaves like waves and also like little particles, which he called photons. So here we have the quantum mechanical model of the atom. So in the quantum mechanical model of the atom, uh, we view the electron as a wave. So a standing wave, similar to a guitar string. We can use a mathematical model to show the shape of our orbitals now. This is called Schrodinger's wave equation. And the circumference of a particular orbit would have to correspond to a number of whole wavelengths, or else you'd get destructive interference. Okay? And this explains why we have this discrete energy levels. This is this is explaining why now, this is explaining why we're seeing this quantization occurring in different energy levels of the electrons in an atom. Now, in terms of the important things to remember on this slide, so you don't need to know any of the mathematics that are shown on this slide, so you don't need to be able to reproduce any of the diagrams that are shown in this slide. The important things here is that in the quantum mechanical model, the electrons behave as waves, and we use Schrodinger's wave equation uh, to predict these orbitals. Here's an example of what the s orbital looks like. Now this is based on the solution to Schrodinger's equation. So what an orbital is in the quantum mechanical model is a region of space. And in that region of space, you've got a 90% probability of finding an electron. Okay, so the idea is it's a shape around the nucleus where you've got a high probability of finding an electron. We don't concern ourselves with how the electron moves. We don't consider is the electron orbiting the nucleus, okay, for example. All we're concerned with is that the electron exists within this region of space. And an s orbital has a spherical shape. It's shaped like a sphere. 
moving along to these p orbitals. Now p orbitals are what we call degenerate orbitals. They're degenerate because for example the 2p orbitals each have the same energy level. So any set of p orbitals in a particular subshell has the same energy level. So the 2px, the 2py, the 2pz each of these are having the same energy level. And you can see they've got a particular shape to them. So some people say this is like a dumbbell shape, or I always think it looks like two balloon party balloons that have been inflated and then tied together uh, at the knot to produce these shapes. Moving along to now the P, the D, and the F orbitals. You can see these have their own unique shapes as well. You don't need to memorize the shapes. The shapes become important later on if we're looking at say why a particular molecule uh, has a particular shape, so why atoms have particular geometries to them when they're bonding together, but right now uh, these don't have a, a, a particular importance to us other than just for your interest. This is what they look like. You don't need to reproduce diagrams of these in the exam or anything like this. So the d orbitals are also degenerate, the f orbitals are also degenerate, they have the same energy level moving along. Uh, this slide is just showing us a practical example where we have now some salts that are dissolved in methanol. They're set on fire and they're producing different colours. The reason why we're seeing different colours for the lithium, the copper and the sodium salts is because the, the atoms are different, the elements are different. So when we've got now the electrons being excited up to high energy states and they're relaxing and they're producing photons of light, these are associated, these photons are associated with a different wavelength, so they're going to produce a different colour of light. Okay, this is just a practical example showing what we've explained before. Moving along now to the periodic table. So the periodic table is something that we've discussed before, so it's an arrangement of elements in tabular form based on periodic law. Periodic law states that elements which have similar chemical properties occur at regular or periodic intervals. The current modern periodic table is arranged so that elements with similar chemical properties are found in vertical columns which are termed groups or families. The horizontal rows of the periodic table are called periods or rows. Let's have a look at the periodic table below to observe the numbering system for groups and periods. So here we have, you can see group 1a, there's a little periodic table representation of one here in the top left hand corner. Group 1a is our alkali metals. So lithium, sodium, potassium, we know that these have similar chemical reactivity. And also here in group 7a, chlorine, bromine, iodine, these have different chemical reactivity as well. All you need to get out of this slide is that we're grouping our elements together in certain groups on the periodic table based on their reactivity. But as you have a look at the electronic configuration, you'll get more of a feel for why the periodic table actually is shaped the way it is and why it's organized the way it is. Here's a slide that shows us a periodic trend and that trend is the size of atoms or atomic radius. Okay, moving from left to right across the periodic table we have a decrease in atomic radius. Now this might not be what you're expecting initially so you might be expecting that okay as we move from left to right across the periodic table we're expecting the atoms to be getting larger and larger because we're getting more and more electrons being added to our atoms. But in fact they're getting smaller and the reason why they're getting smaller is because remember these electrons are only being added into degenerate uh, orbitals. Okay, So they're not actually being added into an orbital that's further away from the centre of the atom. Now I know that that might sound like a, a complicated definition. Now, this might be something that you have to come back to after you've finished the lecture, you've done some examples of your orbital diagrams, and you've done some examples of your electronic configurations. You've come back now to looking at periodic trends, and you're wanting to understand why, why these atoms are getting smaller as we move from left to right. It's because, consider your p orbitals are degenerate, they've got the same energy level, so as we're adding electrons, we're not necessarily making the atom larger, but as we're adding protons to the nucleus, the nucleus is getting more and more positively charged, 
and it's pulling those electrons in closer. So the atoms are actually getting smaller as we move from left to right. Okay, as we move from top to bottom, they get larger. The reason why they get larger is because we're adding electrons to uh, higher and higher energy level shells, which make which makes the atoms larger and larger as the electrons are getting further away from the nucleus. So there's our periodic trend. So the increase in atomic radius as we move from right to left and from top to bottom. Okay. So here's another periodic trend. So we're increasing in ionization energy as we move from left to right. So ionization energy is the ability to ionize a, a, an atom or an element. So we're, uh, we're removing an electron, in other words. So quite easy to remove an electron from lithium or sodium or potassium, much harder to remove an electron from fluorine or chlorine or bromine. So the ionization energy is getting greater as we move from left to right and also uh, increases as we go from bottom to top because these atoms down the bottom, the electrons are further away, they're easier to remove. So for electronegativity, now uh, electronegativity is, relates to the, well, it's similar to electron affinity, which we'll see on the next slide, but electron, electronegativity is the ability of an, an atom to draw electrons to itself when it's taking part in a covalent bond. So fluorine has a very high level of electronegativity. So the, the noble gases are not considered to have any electronegativity at all because they're, they're not reactive. Fluorine will have quite a high electronegativity for this reason. It will draw electrons close to itself, whereas francium won't have a very high electronegativity. Moving along to electron affinity, it follows the same trend as electronegativity. Now, electron affinity is the ability to attract an electron, so to completely remove an electron and attract one. Again, fluorine is very high. It wants another electron, so it can be like neon, whereas francium does not have a great want to gain another electron. Francium has a low electron affinity. Moving along. Okay, so in this diagram we have the sets of orbitals for hydrogen. Now this is only true for hydrogen. So you can see that for hydrogen all of the orbitals in the same n, well this is the principal quantum number, all of the orbitals in the same n are degenerate, meaning that they have the same energy. This won't be true for any other any other atom or element that we have a look at. But you can see n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, increasing uh, in terms of energy. So we've got our 1s, our 2s, our 2p, our 3s, our 3p, our 3d. But you can see that these orbitals, so for those of you that have gone and done the tutorial, you can see that these actually match the orbitals that we see in, in other atoms as well. Okay, So we have, we have a 1s, we have a 2s, we have a, a 2p, you know, we've got your three boxes or your three lines or your three orbitals or however you like to think of them in that subshell, that 2p subshell, and so on. So the actual order for polyelectronic atoms, so polyelectronic just means any atom that has more than one electron. So atoms with more than one electron, which is pretty much all of them except for hydrogen. So we go from 1s, 2s to 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, and so on. So here's something that I'll point out as well is that You'll have this diagram in the exam, and you can see that you're actually told that the 2p subshell has three orbitals. The 3p subshell has three orbitals. The 3d has five, and so on. You can see that's actually given to you as well. So you'll always know how many boxes to draw to put your arrows in when you're doing an orbital diagram. So here's the electronic configuration. So the electronic configuration is something that you'd normally do after you've done your orbital diagram, okay? Now, after you practice a few of these, obviously, you can probably quite easily jump straight to the electronic configuration without having done the orbital diagram, but when you're first learning these, I think it's useful to do the orbital diagram first and then move along and do the electronic configuration. So you can see the electronic configuration for hydrogen, for example, is 1s1. For helium, 1s2. For lithium, 1s2, 2s1. Okay, and so on as we move through. So here are some orbital diagrams. You can see here we've got lithium. So lithium, now it might be handy to have a periodic table for this. So here we've got lithium. It might be handy to have a periodic table handy for this. So you've got your, your 1s, 2s, 
and then the two p orbitals to fill in. So moving along, so lithium, you can probably hear me getting my periodic table out. So you can see here you've got lithium now finishing on 2s1. So one, two, three electrons, one, two, three electrons. Remember to pair up those arrows first. Okay, so we're going to fill the 1s orbital, then we start on the 2s orbital. When we get to the degenerate orbitals, like the 2p's or the 3d's, you know, the p's and the d's and the f's, you actually fill each orbital with one arrow first, then you go back to the start and start pairing them up. So here are some abbreviated electronic structures. So aluminium and rubidium. So aluminium can be neon. So we're actually putting we're putting neon in square brackets now, which means okay, electronic structure all the way up to neon, and then 3s2, 3p1. And rubidium, which means okay, electronic structure all the way up to krypton, and then we've got a 5s1 for rubidium. And electronic structures of ions are done exactly the same way, but just remember if it's got a negative charge on your ion, then you add an extra electron. And if you've got a positive charge on there, you're actually taking an electron away. It's as easy as that. And we're almost finished the lecture now, almost at the end of the lecture. Here's another example of what your S and your P orbitals look like. So principal uh, level one, then increasing in energy, we get to principal level two. Then we've got our 2p sublevel, also on the second energy level there. You've probably got more of an appreciation of what this actually means now that you've, you've sat through the lecture. And this is just a practical example. So fireworks, I'm not sure what you might use this information for, but uh, these are the different salts that are used when making fireworks to get the different colours based on the wavelength. So remembering that when energy is being put into these these elements, we're exciting the electrons to a higher energy level, then they're relaxing, we're releasing light of a particular wavelength, and this is what's giving us now the different colours that we get uh, in our fireworks, in our pyrotechnics. Thank you very much for paying attention, and I'll see you all in class.